consciousness, language, and poetry, because that's sort of, I think, the sticking point. Language is just a definition. Its purpose is to define, and it's made of definitions. That is all it is. It is a representation of um, truth, of a description of the story. I could say the word life and poof. It's a word that has it's a long story, has all kinds of physics and biology and all kinds of stuff to it. So it's a big, giant, huge concept. Maybe all people can't communicate using just one generic word and say the word and we understand each other because we're all going to focus on different parts of that specific and I don't think in any one conscious moment we could actually contemplate life and have an image or a, a sense of it in any moment of consciousness. It really can't be grasped in anything but over a a very protracted period of time. I mean, you could spend a year contemplating life and all the nuances before you would have contemplated a relatively complete picture of life, our understanding, our representation. There are things in reality that might take a person a year to describe or to define even with our, even using the best of our language. I'm not discounting that fact. I guess I'm sort of reacting because it's all this, these words are a problem. I mean, I've done a video on this. I'm really irritated by the seizure of words. Objectivism, Ayn Rand's word, and no one else can touch it. She's defined what objective means as a philosophy. I believe in attempting to duplicate the objective perspective it's nothing like her philosophy and yet we're stuck with these same words and so a lot of i guess what trips me up is having to attempt to talk when i have to use words that other people are going to react to as if i'm advocating a philosophy when i'm not i'm taking the word more literally or at least i'm using it in a, in a way that seems commonsensical to me and isn't going to be the same for them and um, consciousness is just a manifestation of a material reality it itself i would argue is not a material thing it does not have a material existence it is a, a manifestation it is a something that goes with the operation of this it's like a machine will make noise and and create pollution and do this and do, do it has certain things that happen when it is running. That's the spinning top maybe is a better example. When it is spinning, certain forces are activated, certain rules governing its existence that are very different when it's just sitting on the table doing nothing. It's almost a, a different reality when it's spinning. And for us, when our brains are working, yeah, we have this, this different reality. This, the spinning is taking place and so there's these forces and these this thing happening and it ends up being consciousness but i would also argue that it's not magic i think obviously consciousness is dependent on sophistication i mean you have to have the the extended memory to be able to um, maximize the conscious experience or at least it, it maximizes the experience it, it it adds nuance and intensity to the consciousness because maybe just the raw feeling of pain it's like maybe just an electrical spark it's just the it's 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 you know without context it has so much less impact as a conscious event perhaps perspective adds a lot to it i guess um this perspective we build up by having this more complex consciousness but i guess the roots of consciousness are in what I would describe as that lizard brain and that with each expansion on the brain that consciousness is enhanced. I don't think it's really a collective product, it's probably a product of one part of the brain and that these other parts enhance what is happening through that piece of pipe or through that, that prism, that whatever it is that makes consciousness happen. To get to the poetry part of it, like I said, I think poetry, I mean, I think what you're looking for is you're looking for something better than viewing the human race or our lives as just an extension, a biological and evolutionary extension of a maggot. I mean, you don't want to look at human life, at your life, at your I, your ego as 
as something as mechanical as a mouth and an ass something that just consumes something that just has parts compelled to do something by a natural selection process that compel it to behave and compel it to function that there's nothing more magnificent than that and so I think you're looking for the excuse of this this thing called poetry. You want more to the story. And so it's almost an excuse, I think, to say, because our language is limited and we cannot describe in a single sentence or a few words complex reality, we will, we will deny the existence of it or we will deny the functionality of language. That's, to me, unfair. I mean, what we, don't, what we, can, what we have to accept is just this, these, these limitations. It takes us time to absorb information. It takes us time to expel it. We're not operating on broadband, okay? It's, it's got to go little bits at a time between us. And, uh, but that doesn't mean there's a more complex story. There's, you know, power in poetry, power in taking a complex idea, reducing it to these interacting symbols that can explain a complex idea, you know, in a simpler form. And it's a hieroglyphics of sorts. It's a, it's a type of language. It's just a little different. And for the greater power it gives you, it takes a little bit away in that it's not as accurate but it is more accurate in conveying the largeness of an idea because it expresses the emotion and it invokes much more feeling and thought that maybe a precise definition wouldn't have.